Hello and welcome back to Riz Gaming, Elden Ring and the Things You Didn't Know series. Today we have a very important thing to know going into the DLC, some follow-up suggestions based on some previous topics and some interesting observations. As always, this series exists and continues largely down to you guys giving me that back and forth and making suggestions, all that good stuff in the comments. A big thank you as always for all the support and engagement that really keeps this series going. It'd be really cool if we could make it all the way to the DLC, but we'll have more stuff to talk about again. But now though, let's begin today's episode. We begin with that very important detail to know going into the Elden Ring DLC, where we might be facing those that live in undeath, aka skeletons, undead, the death birds, those types of enemies. You probably know that if you use, say, holy damage weapons with these types of buffs, you'll deal extra damage to those enemies. The problem is you need to commit to make that happen. So with a weapon like this, you're going to need at least 20 faith, and obviously you're going to want higher stats than that to run it as your main build. What if you're a normal build that runs any other weapon, like your strength build, your dex build, magic, whatever it is. Well, you can still reap the rewards of dealing with those that live in undeath. By using this weapon, Golden Epitaph, you can use its Ash of War, Last Rites, which buffs up your damage and increases your damage against those that live in undeath, giving you that same holy damage benefit where if you kill those that live in undeath, they usually try to revive and you have to do a finishing blow. Well, no, they just instantly die because holy damage. What's insane about this weapon is that it requires 12 strength and 10 dex, stats that pretty much every build will have by default, and then 14 faith, which if you somehow don't have that, say you start with nine, you can just pop on the two fingers heirloom and get the faith required, put it on, pop the buff on, and the best part is you don't even need the weapon. You can see that I've got the sword buff there. I am now completely unequipping the weapon and I still have those golden lines and that sword buff showing that I still have that benefit. There is absolutely no downside to doing this. You're increasing your actual AR and you're nearly tripling the damage you're going to deal to those that live in undeath. Let me provide an example. What we're going to do is we're going to take this completely unupgraded weapon, the Godskin Stitcher here, and show how much damage it does without the buff and how much damage it does with the buff because in 1.07 they increase the amount of damage you deal against those that live in death with this buff and it's outrageous so i'm two-handing the rapier against this guy let's see how much damage i do when he acknowledges me so it's not an ambush there we go so we're doing 61 damage a hit now i will pop on last rites real quick swap back to the completely unupgraded weapon and attack and we're doing 143 that's about 2.5 times the amount of damage i was doing and again this is a completely unupgraded weapon and yet it's really quite effective like so i'm one-shotting them and it's completely unupgraded and again i don't even need to deal with the weight of this weapon i can unequip it and still have the benefits of that buff there is no downside then i'm gonna apply the buff and actually put on a weapon of my choosing and see how much damage i'm actually doing with this set as you can see we're hitting 4k a hit here if i do a melee and the attack at the same time seven and a half thousand damage on one strike on this type of enemy. Have a look at it against an average death bird about mid game, literally one shots it. Or in the end game, one of the highest health death birds in the game, in the in a consecrated snowfield of all places, it's a three hit. This is obviously a holy warrior build, so it's obviously gonna be doing good damage, but that buff is insane. I feel like they've overtuned it. If there are enemies that live in undeath in the DLC, you are going to want to have this weapon ready. I'm wondering whether they're going to walk back the amount of damage they've increased this buff by. But for now, we can really benefit from it, so why not? A topic we have a bit of a back and forth on in the comments right now is crafting. What are really useful things you can craft and make use of, and what are great farm locations to get the things required to make them? One of the most straightforward and very impactful things you can make is this sleep pot, requiring mushrooms and trina's lilies it's not too hard to make because mushrooms you can find everywhere and trina's lilies well actually hang on those are exceedingly rare to find apparently but not so as a quick demonstration of the power of sleep pots i'm just gonna throw one at a giant and i have no arcane in this build by the way so if i had had more arcane this would be even more effective put it straight to sleep and then that gives me a free critical obviously that's really useful against enemies super vulnerable to sleep like these giants or any enemy that can be staggered by them, especially various bosses. Here at the left side of the mountaintops of the giants, we have the apostate derelict. Adrian Bledsoe in the comments lets us know that there's actually a great farming spot for that so-called exceedingly rare material. Right behind it are jellyfish, and these jellyfish 
actually drop that item. Especially with a bit of raised discovery, we can benefit from that. By killing just a couple of them, we can get some drops. And of course, they drop them, the Trina's Lilies. Now, yes, you can also pick up an absolute pile of them right here as well. But if I reload the area, it's not like they're constantly spawning here. There is a kind of limited supply. However, the jellyfish themselves, obviously, as I've just shown, drop them every now and then from a kill. So if you're able to increase your discoverability, maybe you've got some arcane, or you're running, say, the talisman silver scarab, or the consumable, the silver pickled foul foot, you can get these to drop more consistently. And actually, these guys are a bit ranged, so it'd be good if you could have some ranged options yourself, like I'm using here. But as you can see, it doesn't take too much to get drops from them and you can get some other useful stuff like grave glove wall so a good tip there thank you very much next up we have a discovery from the one and only sekiro doobie our cut content restorer and great youtube creator doobie is well worth following on twitter with loads of topics and discussions to do with hidden content and things not used or maybe to be used in the future a great example of that would be this horn that was never used a very detailed icon found in the game files but not associated with anything in game however the values seem to be tied to fear interesting in itself because it could have been a type of weapon or usable item to blow a horn and summon something or serve a purpose perhaps in one main quest line. Horns and such have been seen in the Soul series before. It's not that unusual to think that one could be used as a sort of tool or item. After all, there are various tools in this game, like say the ancestral deer head, that can be used for some unique animations and some good benefits. So maybe the horn type was one that was going to be used because further, there was a whole animation found in the files by Doobie as well, which shows the use blowing a horn in kind of triumphant way. It's a slower animation. From left to right, you blow the horn and hold it for a period. We've seen with other cut content, musical notes and possible things that would have been used with the various merchants you find around the world, using them for attacks or buffs or heals. So this horn lines up with other musical instruments that weren't ended up being used or used as much as they could have been. And it makes me wonder whether we'll see anything like this in the DLC, perhaps to do with the arenas. It wouldn't surprise me if they added some new emotes or usable items such as a horn. Next up, we have a neat little tip to do with the dragon incantations, those transformations. Of course, we can see there's a variety of types of dragon transformations. We got fire, we got magma, we got this blue magic, we've got the scarlet rot, we've got ice, and of course, we have the more physical transformations in dragon claw and the bite and the raw. Now, these are incantations. It even says incantation right under the description of the ability, even under the blue ones, which specifically say that they spew magic breath. But the thing is, despite the other ones being just incantations that would benefit, yes, from incantation boosters, these blue fire transformations are indeed magic-based spells. Meaning, you can enhance their damage not just with incantation boosters, but specifically with magic enhancers. For example, Terra Magica is probably one of the most important ones to know about. Increasing the magic damage abilities you have by 35% while you stand in it. So you can increase your blue fire incantations with your dragon transformations massively with that alone. Of course, there's other ways to further improve your magic attack, such as the magic scorpion charm at the cost of some damage negation, but perfectly fine in PvE that. Or more obvious ones like the magic shrouding cracked tier, which boosts magic attacks in your wondrous physic. Basically, it's important to know that this is indeed a magical ability and you can enhance its magic with magic enhancers, but it's still also officially an incantation. So the Phlox Canvas Talisman, which greatly raises potency of incantations, still is relevant, making them quite the potent, just raw magic damage options that you can thoroughly increase the damage of, which is important to know if you're ever playing a dragon-based build. Next, we find ourselves in Faramazula, which we're actually going to talk about a little bit at the end of the episode, but we're here for a very specific reason, the God Skin Duo, which apparently has a mechanic that is really interesting. Clay Clark says that we know that they actually read your inputs. And, you know, in hindsight, I believe it. It's not just the godskins, but the draconic tree sentinels, they also react when, say, you use a heal. So whenever you use a heal, often in these kind of fights, say the godskin, they'll immediately charge a black fireball and throw it at you to punish you for healing. And yeah, I'm sure many of us have experienced that. It's really annoying. It's a literal input read, which means when you press your item button, they automatically react by trying to throw that fireball at you, as well as when you try to cast a spell. However, apparently according to Clay Clark, 
we have a really easy way to force them to try to use that fireball, which we could then use to our advantage in various ways. There are loads of options. Obviously, like Clark suggests, there's carrying retaliation, which could be great, but the input you will press is triangle or your upwards button. This would bring up your UI as it's just done now. And that input as the interact button is enough to trigger them to try to throw the fireball as if they think you've just tried to heal or cast a spell or something. This then fake input should be a useful way to abuse. So I'm gonna press the button right now. I'm gonna press triangle. And he jumped to the side and immediately tried to fireball me. Okay, let's try again. No way. And again. Okay, so it doesn't seem like they react to it every single time, but they very clearly don't like it when I'm pressing it. And if they have the free option the moment to do it, they just will, as you can clearly see. That's incredible. They're just spamming it at me because <laughs> I'm just pressing triangle over and over. If it was just one of them, this would obviously give me the opportunity to jump up in the air and hit them with a ranged attack. And as you can see, it's even CCing technically the other one because he's busy trying to throw a fireball at me through a pillar and he can't hit me. That's really good to know, especially in one of the most annoying fights in the entire game. But also, it should work on the Draconic Tree Sentinels. Yeah, really good tip. Thank you, Clark. Whereas on the other end of this topic, we also talked about, yes, the world being closer and more circular, as if uh, Faramazula was a massive city that connected this middle crater, and this crater didn't exist like it did. A lot of people were fairly saying, well, if you zoom in, there's actually a sinkhole, which would be where it would normally be, right? So perhaps this location right here is where Faramazula used to be, right above that wormhole, and it would make sense with a tower just next to it. Further, this is a very important bridge as well as an important building, the Bestial Sanctum and the Farum Great Bridge, the bridge that would lead to the Farum area, starting here at what is now the Bestial Sanctum and then continuing to Farum Azula right here. JHSRT was the one that mentioned the bridge and its name. Mr. Snowball letting me know about that whirlpool on the map. And further, the Bestial Sanctum that we stand in actually has familiar statues and a architecture to Faramazula. This very building could be part of Faramazula and it's just not broken down because it was never ripped away like the whole city was. I think that's a really cool theory and one that I definitely now subscribe to. As much as I like the idea of the world being more circular, what remains suggests that maybe that middle sort of water area here always existed. It's just this is where Faram used to be instead of in the sky like it is behind me. But there you have it, another episode of things you didn't know in Elden Ring. Hopefully you had some useful tips for yourself to go into the DLC or the current game. And let me know if you have any further follow-ups in regards to today's topics. As always though, if there's something interesting you think should be in this series, it hasn't been yet, then drop that in the comments. But for now, I've been Hollow, you've been you, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world our stage Is, uh, goodbye